talking with Gary Carlton today, senior staff engineer at Intel. Hi, Gary. Hi. Welcome. So, Gary, um, you've talked a lot lately about the impact of increasing hardware complexity on parallel developers. Well, what what is that complexity, and how does that affect developers? I think we're seeing two or three specific things happening right now in terms of the systems that are available, and frankly, the uh, compute. Uh, architecture that programmers are going to have to deal with and that is we see the number of CPU cores in a system almost exploding. Uh, we're, we have more and more processors that have multiple cores in them. Thanks to you guys. Yeah and in addition with the Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor we're looking at you know 60 cores in a particular single processor Hmm. And, and with systems that can have multiple processors like that, uh, we just are ending up with a large number of CPU cores hmm. requiring a huge amount of parallelism hmm. to be built into the program uh, so that those cores can be used. Hmm. There's, there's a real change from you know, the two to three to four kind of CPU cores in the system to really hundreds. Hundreds. And that's, that's occurring now. And that goes down to, uh, I know you've talked about thread count, uh, right. vector width, and just huge explosion in general in yeah. computer resources. I mean, just tons of open road out there. So, so those are additional, uh, additional things that need to be thought about, not just the number of cores, but the number of threads. We can have multiple threads, hardware threads inside the cores. So there's a multiplicative factor. If you have you know, 500 cores in a system, you could be looking at way more than that in terms of number of threads. Hmm. So software needs to be architected, not just to you know, run through an algorithm and, and get done, but to do that in parallel, in a widely parallel kind of thing. Hmm. The other thing you discussed was uh, the width of registers, I think, is the way yeah. you, you put it. Yeah. So that's another thing is that we have these parallel instructions uh, that uh, programmers can make use of and hopefully compilers make use of. They're getting wider and wider, allowed, allowing more parallelism in terms of one instruction operating on multiple sets of data. Hmm. So the width of that multiple sets is just getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we have 512-bit registers in the Xeon Phi coprocessor, so we can operate on many different uh, sets of operands all at the same time. Hmm. The problem is the software needs to be architected to be able to do that. Programmers need to be thinking of and using tools that are able to help address all of these sort of exploding width issues of hmm. having way more cores than, than there have been in the past way more threads than there have been in the past, and a wider ability to do more operations per, or, or operate on more data per, uh, instruct, per individual instruction than in the past. Mm -hmm. All three of these different components are, are causing uh, parallelism uh, explosion, <laughs> I guess is the way and to say it. And parallelism paralysis, if you don't know what yeah, you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem is, Again, perhaps I'm repeating myself, but programmers need to be thinking about and dealing with the, this sudden explosion of width of mm. both the registers and the number of cores that are out there. Mm. So you need tools that, that can help you do that. Uh, you need to know how to use those tools, and you need to be able to think of architecting the program so that the tools can do their job and provide this amount of parallelism. Mm. One of the things you talk about uh, in this, both this current series, uh, the spring iStep series, so-called, the developer conferences uh, hosted by Intel based on parallel right. uh, processing and development, is the need for cooperation between the developer and the compiler. Well, I think this is, this is something we started thinking about a number of years ago but it is becoming more true, again, based on all this uh, vectorization and parallelization mm -hmm. that we're doing. You know, in the older days, you'd give your program, your source code to the compiler, the compiler would compile it, and, and that was the deal. But it's becoming uh, more of a partnership, I feel, in terms of the developer and the compiler. Mm. The compiler does not have enough information on its own to really produce 
the vast number of threads and, and vectorized loops and all this type of thing that it really can. It's up to the, uh, it's up to the programmer to give the compiler uh, the proper input to be able to generate these wider programs, these vectorizable programs, these parallelizable programs. So in, in some ways, it's actually a kind of a give and, a give and take kind of a thing. The, the programmer puts in the source code, the compiler puts it back out, but puts out the object code. But really, the programmer needs to help the compiler by giving hints or pragmas or using higher level constructs that can communicate certain kinds of uh, behaviors that the program has mm -hmm. that the compiler just can't figure out by itself. Mm -hmm. In more detail, we're talking about things like uh, pointer aliasing. It's probably the, the classic case, but there can be issues with uh, data type uh, changes and, and just other things where the programmer has information that the compiler can use, but the programmer has to you know, proactively take the job of communicating back to the compiler. And frankly, it goes the other way, too. If the compiler is trying to optimize a particular loop, and it can't for some reason, like it, it believes there is some type of memory aliasing going on, it's up to the compiler to tell the programmer, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you, have, you wrote this code here, but I can't do anything with it, and here's the reason why. So we have uh, compiler optimization reports and vectoriz vectorization reports that allow the compiler to talk back to, that's probably the wrong way to say it. <laughs> communicate with. Yeah, to communicate back to the programmer about how the, the program could be changed so the compiler can do something with it. Mm. So there's communication that needs to go both ways. I love the question that you posed before. Uh, and in fact, we might just call this Carlton's question. Uh, let's, let's give a name to this right now. What can the compiler do, and what can you do to help the compiler? Yeah. I think that's a great question for people. So Carlton's question, what the, can the compiler do, and what can you do to help the compiler? Yeah. I, I think that's a great summation of what, you, what you've been talking it, about. It, it's still the same idea. It's not you know, one, one entity, the programmer doing something, and then the compiler doing something else. There needs to be this communication flow. Hmm. It, it's, not, it's not a one-way uh, one way thing. Hmm. So how does, um, you spend a fair amount of time talking about uh, the tools here. We're talking specifically about uh, Intel uh, Amplifier XC 2013. Can you talk a little bit about what that is uh, for folks who might not be familiar and how that helps some of the problems that we're talking about here. So that's a performance analysis tool whose goal is to help the programmer find issues uh, in terms of performance with their program and identify perhaps what can be done to make the program run faster. Now, run faster has taken on uh, a new definition in recent years. You know, it used to just be, let's make this program go through the CPU a little bit quicker in mm -hmm. some way. But there's an element of parallelization now and vectorization. It's back to what we talked about with the compiler. Mm -hmm. um, to get the best performance, to maximize the performance of your software, uh, you really need to make use of all the different resources that are available inside the processor. And that means all these multiple CPU cores that are, that are available. That means all the vectorization registers and capabilities that are available. And VTune can help in analyzing whether that's occurring or not. Hmm. VTune has a number of different modes that can do things like identify where there are performance hotspots, identify if there's a particular CPU activity that's limiting the, the speed of those hotspots, like cache misses or branch mispredictions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the ability to identify what synchronization objects are blocking threads. Hmm. This is a classic problem where, you know, maybe the instructions are going through the processor really fast, but you're still not actually getting enough things done. Uh, it could be that we have uh, computational threads that are being blocked by some waiting for some other resource from somewhere else. So VTune has a mode where uh, it will run the program, watch for threads that block, and then present a list of those specific synchronization objects that are causing threads to block for the longest period of time. Mm. Uh, so there's many different aspects of performance. Threads blocking, uh, 
CPU hotspots, cache misses. Um, in addition, uh, we have the ability to look at um, other kinds of things uh, relating to uh, uh, sort of interactions between all of these things. Mm. So it's not that easy to, for example, analyze just what cache misses are doing, but what's better to understand is what's the actual rate at, at which they're occurring and is that a high enough rate to be affecting performance. Mm -hmm. So there's some interpretation of the resulting data that VTune will help with also. It doesn't just gather the data, it'll, it'll look at you and say, you know, right here is where there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that branch misprediction is not going well. It is slowing down the program in this particular location. And does VTune give users a sense, uh, developers a sense of prioritization of the slowdowns that uh, this is a bigger problem than this, is a bigger problem than this, this yes. is a bigger problem yes, than this. Yes, there is some of that. Although it's, you know, ultimately programmers have to earn their money and they have to be programmers. So, uh, so I think some of the prioritization is really, uh, starts to fall in the judgment of the programmer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, the, all of these tools are trying to do as much as they can to help the programmer, uh, you know, in terms of information flow and trying to uh, give to the programmer ideas on the behavior and improving the behavior of their program. But ultimately, the programmer still is the one that has to, uh, you know, go change the code and fix the programs. So. Your daily key. Um, final question. Any tips or secrets or best practices uh, either for using Intel 2013 amplifier VTune or just parallel development in general? I think specifically for the uh, Intel VTune amplifier XE 2013, uh, you know, there are, I mentioned there's a number of different modes here. You can do a lot of different things with it. I think the right order of using those, you know, the process of using them is probably, you know, the first thing you do is just look at the hotspots, look at the CPU hotspots. So you run the hotspot collector with VTune, you look and see, and then you see if you see anything obvious. There may be something in your own algorithm that is, that is strange or that, that can come apparent when you suddenly see that a specific place is the hotspot. Mm -hmm. So I think just identifying the CPU hotspots and seeing if there's any low-hanging fruit right at that point is probably the first thing you do. You know, if you don't see anything obvious there, probably the next thing to do is this mode that we call general exploration, where you tell VTune, you go out and look at all these different CPU performance metrics, and you tell me if there's a problem. Tell me if there's too much branch misprediction, it's slowing the program down. Tell me if there's too many cache misses, too many TLB misses. I think that's the, probably the second mode, the second thing that you do. You don't do that first, you know. You look at the hotspots, if you can't figure out what, what the problem is there, the next step is probably general exploration. You get an idea of whether there are certain behaviors inside the processor that are causing trouble. Perhaps the next step is to start thinking about the threading model mm. and use that locks and weights collector we talked about. Identify what particular synchronization objects are in fact causing threads to block for the longest period mm. of time. Gareth Carlton, Intel, thank you very much. Sure, thank Pleasure. you, Joe. Take care.